All right. Mark chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible reads, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was in there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. And after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Something big happened. This event is about to change all of history. What got the devil's attention is that Jesus Christ is about to launch his ministry. He is about to launch his ministry, fulfill his mission and call to die and raise himself from the dead and give salvation to all of mankind. Uh, such an important event that it changed from B.C. to A.D. And the devil knew that. He was not stupid. Uh, he, Jesus got the devil's attention. God said, this is my beloved son. And when Satan saw that, he said, I need to do all that I can to get rid of Jesus Christ. And what is so interesting is that it's not just the devil attacking Jesus as soon as God approved of Jesus' ministry. What's also very interesting is God let that happen. The Father, as a matter of fact, the Father's will was to drive Jesus into the trial, the testing, the fire from Satan. And God said, have at him, Satan. And that was Satan's chance. Why? Because something big was about to happen. When something big happens, when the Lord is about to do something great in your life, that is when the gates of hell open up and those minions keep an eye and a track on you and they're like, okay, before they hit a point where their life is about to change, where they're about to make a dedication commitment to God, where they're going to turn around, we need to put everything in our fury to get him off track. Why do they know that? Because they've seen that every single time with thousands of other Christians who have gone before us. So they know a pattern of God's working at times. And that's the reason why they'll attack when something big's about to happen. That happened with the life of Christ. And why not with your life? I hope that today's preaching will help you. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and cleanse away my sins with your blood. The words that I speak on this pulpit and what I even pray just feel like uh, empty air, Father. But, uh, Lord, I know that uh, you use me and that uh, when you're in it, you can turn empty air into something great. I mean, you inspired your words. That's God breathed, Lord. You can use something great like that. Uh, Lord, will you do something with this message where you can be glorified, these people's lives could be changed, and they could, it can help them. It can help them carry through the week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, the, first point, the first point is the pleasure of Christ. The pleasure of Christ. Let's look at verse 11. Notice that God is pleased with Jesus Christ. Jesus found pleasure in the Lord. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art m my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then the Bible says, verse 12, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was tempted of Satan. Notice that when God is pleased, immediately that's when the devil starts to attack. The devil starts to attack. Why? 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 Because God is pleased with you. Isn't that encouraging? Oh, it's so discouraging when you go through hardship and the devil starts to attack against you. But isn't it encouraging that God is pleased with you today? God is pleased with you today. Uh, a lot of you look down on that. A lot of you don't see that. Uh, some of you may not uh, do something big or great in your eyes, but in God's eyes, in the Holy Spirit's eyes, it's about to be something big for you in your life. I have known some people in this church, and they can tell you as evidence that it's at that moment of their deepest, darkest pit moment, when the devil starts to attack, their life turned around and changed into a 180. Why? It's because God was about to do something big 
in their lives. And they didn't know that. You have no idea what God has prepared for you. Something big, something great, and he's going to turn your life around. Maybe a soul will get saved. Maybe someone, uh, someone in your family or in your home is about to be changed. Or better yet, your own life is about to be transformed for the better, where you will mature more. Your character, your mentality will change. Many times when it was those moments, I feel like I was going to lose my own life. My life turned around and I became 50 times stronger and 50 times a better preacher. And to be honest, I will tell you that I would not trade that. I would not trade that. I am very thankful for the preacher God has created me today. But that comes with a heavy price. That comes with pain. And why would the Lord allow these things is because he's pleased with you. Amen. Doesn't that make you happy? Sometimes you feel like that you don't do something great for the Lord. You're not that big for the Lord and you wish you can do more for the Lord. My friend, God will give you something to do. Amen. Something big. Something big. But your problem is, is that you don't receive it. That big thing, that big moment is that trial. It's that test. It's that pain that he's putting you through because he wants to create something big out of that Think about it. When something bad happens in your life, that means Jehovah himself sees that. That means God himself sees that as that child is fit yeah. to do, to carry that burden and complete this task for me. Yeah. Isn't that great? God entrusted you with that pain. Sometimes we dramatize our pain or it might even be a great pain that we have. But the reason why that pain is so great is because God sees you as special that he trusts to complete that task that you can bear and you can accomplish. That's how pleased he is. Man, isn't that great? Man, you, take, you think too little of yourself. You know, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? What does that mean? That means that God knows you're compatible. You're fit to carry that temptation. That you can accomplish that big mission for him, that big trial, that big temptation, that pain that is so big and so great no one else is doing it, that's how special you are to God. And he assigned that to you. Your problem, obviously, is you don't see what you're doing as a real big deal for God. That the struggle you're going through, that you're fighting, is a really big deal for the Lord. Well, yeah, if you don't, the devil does. And that's the reason why he keeps tempting you. That's why he'll keep throwing you a fit and he just wants you to quit. So remember this, if you don't see it, the devil does. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a good time that you see it yourself? If the enemy sees it more than you, then this is going to be very dangerous. You're at a disadvantage. He has the upper hand and he'll get you. My second point is the pushing of Christ. The pushing of Christ. Let's look at verse 12. Notice that Jesus Christ was pushed into the wilderness, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. <laughs> Why would the Holy Spirit want that? Isn't it interesting that verse 13, Jesus went into the wilderness when the Holy Spirit could have just filled within him and he could have done verse 15 instead? Have you ever heard preachers talking about being filled with the power of the Spirit? So Holy Spirit filled that souls will fill up on the altar and souls will get saved. And atheists whose hearts were hearted, they just melted at the power of the Word of God. And when you look at these mighty men of old from the Great Awakening revivals who had such a gift of the tongue and the gift to preach, men and people like me would go, wow, something like that. And they would have that Elisha mentality. Lord, give me a double portion of what that man had. And the filling power of the Holy Spirit is so coveted. And you would want that. And you go, man, I want at least a little bit of that. I want something like that. Well, my friend, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not preaching at the Great Awakening Revival. It's not verse 15, repent ye and believe the gospel. No, the Holy Spirit fills you when verse 13, he pushes you into the wilderness. That's when he can fill you. You want that filling power of God? You want the Holy Spirit to fill your life that 
just out of your testimony, your demeanor, people can see something different and it affects them. Man, when I heard these stories of great men and women of old, just by their testimony, just by their, uh, just by the aura around them, their personality, it just moves mountains. And they had a faith that God would answer prayers and move the impossible odds. And I want some of that. Well, if you want the Holy Spirit to fill you, it's not at the accomplishments of the Holy Spirit you're looking at. You think that person is Holy Spirit filled because you keep looking at the accomplishments. The numbers of souls saved, the great building, impossible odds, and answered prayer requests. My friend, that is not where the Holy Spirit filling is found. That's called the results of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is when that flesh is emptied. When flesh is emptied, the Holy Spirit says, finally, some room for me. Well, how do you get your flesh emptied? It needs to be driven. It needs to be pushed into the wilderness. Well, I don't believe that. Then you try going by your own flesh how you are right now and be filled with the Spirit. Won't work. You know how you be filled with the Spirit? That flesh gets pinned down and crucified and hurt. And yes, it is those dark moments. You might say, why is that? Because there's so much of self in there. Unconscious self that you don't know about unconscious things that you're struggling with, some weaknesses, imperfections, and even sins that God says, you need to let that go and give it to me. Amen. And you go, oh, that's so hard, Lord. And God says, that's right, but the Holy Spirit can't have room there if you keep that in there. And you need to give it to me. You know what I'm talking about? If you went through suffering, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's at those moments that the Holy Spirit fills you. you the Holy Spirit pushes and drives for not souls saved, not numbers, and not people down on the altar. The Holy Spirit pushes and drives more for suffering. The Holy Spirit drives and craves for let the flesh die. The Holy Spirit drives and craves for let self be put down and let others be put up. The Holy Spirit drives and craves for your desires. Give them up. Let God do what he wants. That's what the Holy Spirit drives and craves for. It's not the shouting. It's not the singing. It's not the hymn tossing. It's not the running around the room. It's not getting soul saved. It's not preaching a great message. The Holy Spirit drives and craves for suffering when ego is put down on the altar and crucified for Jesus' sake. That's what the Holy Spirit drives for. It drives for the wilderness. Why? Be you might say, why? That's already your problem. If you ask me why, you already have a problem. You know why? You don't realize you have a problem. There's so much of you you need to change and fix. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power, the power, the power of Christ may rest upon me. You want the power of God. You want the power of God. Then you need to be weak. Amen. You need to be beaten down. And self must be crucified. That's what the Holy Spirit pushes for drives for, craves for. I know you don't crave for that. I know you don't want that. You know what that is? That's your flesh. That's your flesh. Oh, God, take it away. Oh, God, not this. Oh, God, it's so heavy. No, Lord. And see, you, that's your flesh. But the Holy Spirit, hear me now. When you're praying and you're saying, oh, God, take this thing away from me, like Paul, thorn in the flesh, right? And the flesh says, Lord, take that thing away from me. It's so much. You know what the Holy Spirit's doing? It's interceding on your behalf and praying correctly for you. Yeah. You know what the Holy Spirit says? No, Father, I need more. Wow. Father, give it to me harder. Oh, God, there's this issue that the flesh is refusing to give up. 
God, hit me. And you say, oh, God, don't hit me. And the Holy Spirit cries out, no, Lord, hit me. It drives and craves for self to be crucified so that the power can rise up on high. Holy Spirit cannot fill your life, cannot have power when there's so much of flesh in there, so much of you. There's so much of you you need to change. Yes, sir. Need to change and be crucified and given up. Amen, verse 13, verse 13. The passion of Christ. The passion of Christ. In other words, that, uh, you've heard that term before in uh, Mel Gibson's movie, for example. But basically that word passion means suffering. It actually means suffering. It means trial. If you look at uh, verse 13, my sub-point for point three, my sub-point is the period of Christ. The period of Christ, if you look at verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days. Notice that Jesus Christ had to go through a time period his moment of trial. Thank God that there is a time period for his trial. Thank God that there is a time period for your trial and your pain. You might say, why? You should. A time period means it's temporary. A time period means there is an end. A time period means this don't last forever. My friend, you know why you should enjoy and you should keep going through that wilderness? In that long wilderness, it seems like it's so dry and you're dying of thirst and you just want water to drink. Well, just keep on walking. The oasis is down the end of that wilderness. It's only temporary. It's not forever. So just keep on going. You went through 30 days. You went through 40 days. You went through a long time. Just keep on going. You walked that far don't stop now you probably are almost at the finish line God forbid I stop now after years of hell that I went through God forbid I stop now after years of hell that I went through I'm gonna keep on walking why because it's temporary it's not forever and when you get that big blessing on the end of the road, that lasts for a lifetime. Yeah. It changes your whole life. Amen. It'll be there with you, and the Lord can use it for His glory. Think about it. Some of the things that you've got today, the blessings of the Lord, it carries on and affected and changed your life, didn't it? Can you think of some of them? If you can think of some of those big blessings that change your whole life, do you remember how you got those things? Do you remember how you got those things? Because you had to go through a time period of marching through and enduring. Then you got it. But what if you stopped halfway? What if you just stopped right at the finish line and you said, I quit? Would you enjoy your blessing right now? My second sub-point for the passion of the Christ is the primitiveness of Christ. The primitiveness of Christ Notice that Jesus Christ had to go through primitive animal. He had to encounter primitive animals. He had primitive moments with the wild beasts. Look at the next part of verse 13. <coughs> Tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts. You know, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible uses that same language about beasts that Paul encountered at Ephesus. You know what that means? That means there's a tension, a conflict that's so rough and hard. It says wild too. You know what wild means? It means confusion. Wild means chaotic. Everything's happening at once. You can't do one thing at a time. Everything's happening at once. It means disorganized. That means there's no structure. It doesn't go according to your plan. Beasts. You know what that term is used for throughout the Bible? It's brutal. Brutal. It means no mercy. No matter how much you cry out in pity for help, it means no mercy. Do you really believe that in your trial that there's clarity? That things will go one at a time for you? 
it will go accordingly to your plan. And that when you cry out for help and you want some alternative option to escape, that you'll find it. That's what the world does not understand, nor you. Trial is not a trial if you do find clarity and if you find mercy. Yeah, that's right. Trial and suffering is, no matter how much you cry out in pain, no mercy. Yeah. You know why? Because you're facing an evil foe. Yeah. You're facing an evil foe. No mercy. It's brutal. It's a beast. It will torture, torment, tear up your life. Do you understand what suffering means? Oh, Pastor, I don't know what to do with this suffering. Oh, I'm in trouble. I don't know what to do. You're exactly doing the right thing right now. You're in the right place and the right time. A place of confusion, a place of chaos of everything happening at once, a place of nothing going according to plan, a place of brutality and no mercy. And when you want to, hey, just give me a breather for just five minutes, you don't get it. That's right. You're at the right place. It, You're at the right place. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. You're doing the right thing. Just keep on going because it's a time period. It passes. It comes and goes. You just need to go through it. It comes and goes. My third sub-point, the prop of Christ, the prop of Christ. He received support from others. Notice the last part of verse 13. And the angels ministered unto him. You know what God does? He will minister to you. Trial, suffering, the hard experiences you go through are brutal. They give no mercy. But during those moments, God's going to minister to you. During a time when everything's happening at once, chaotic, and you don't know what to do, God will minister to you. When the, when the things of this life become so brutal and you want mercy and you don't receive it, that's when God will minister to you. The problem is you don't receive it when he offers it to you. That's it, right there. You know, one thing I notice about people is when they go through wild beasts, you know what they immediately do? What they immediately do is with those wild beasts, when God ministers to them and says, here it is, they don't take it. It's a sermon that was preached long ago, but they just forgot it. It was a counsel that was given long ago, but... They just don't apply it. Or they do take some tidbits from the sermon and counsel or from the word of God when God has spoke to them about something. They take some bits of it, but not thoroughly. When God ministers to you, if I were you, I'd eat every bit of food yeah. on that plate yeah. and take it because if I just eat half of it, then my energy might be drained and maybe that's why. I don't feel ministered to during the trial. Have you been really following the precepts? I don't have to give you the tools and the steps on how to conquer suffering. You've heard too many sermons from this church and from others, and you know them yourself, but you need to believe it, you need to practice it, and you need to put your whole heart into it, because if you don't, then it's just a half-hearted ministering that you're getting. And don't blame God and say, it's not working, God. No, God said, I gave it to you. Why did you left over? Take it thoroughly. If I were you, I'd take every opportunity. Whatever God gives to me, his word, prayer, the promise of faith, his blessings to enjoy, the preacher, the fellowship of this church, spiritual advice from others. I take every ounce of it. How can I skip prayer during a time when Satan's pouring out the gates of hell. How can one survive? You are unfathomable to think that I'll be okay. And then when you're going through the trial, you go, I'm not okay. Make up your mind. You know what it is? When the wild beasts come out, you're like, oh, I can't take it. And then 
when God ministers to you, here it is, child, take it. And you go, oh, no, no, I, I'm okay. I, I, I can take it. When God ministers to you, take it. Obey him. That's your problem. You don't obey him. You don't remember what he's given to you. You don't apply it faithfully. Oh, I did it here and there. No, not here and there. Keep on going. Take it, drown your... As a person drowns himself with so much drugs and liquor to erase any ounce and feeling of sadness, take in every scripture and hymn and prayer and spiritual thing and drink yourself, drunk yourself silly to drown out every ounce of pain and suffering. And don't think that one Sunday will cut it. Don't think a blowout will cut it. A blowout is simply like that. It'll just blow out one day. And then what are you going to do? Wait for another year? My fourth point is the prisoner of Christ. The prisoner of Christ. In verse 14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. John is put into prison, and then Jesus is like, that's my cue, now I can preach. <laughs> John had to be put out of the way. He is preaching, had to be put out of the way, so that Jesus can, full blown, can fully shine in his preaching. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He came with something big that changed all the world. But in order to do that, God said, John the Baptist, you have to be put in prison. You have to be taken out of the way. John the Baptist is a prisoner of Christ. There's one thing important that you need to understand. If you want to have the full blessing of God, the full power of God, the fullness of Jesus Christ, like in this text right here, what does, it what does it say? John has to be put into prison. John's not a bad thing. John's used by God. He is filled with the Spirit, and God mightily used him. But God said to John, no, you're smaller compared to Jesus. You know what John said? He must increase. I must decrease. Is John a genuine blessing and power from God? Yes. But it's still very small compared to Jesus. Yeah. Amen. What's my point? Man, you got a John the Baptist. And it's a genuine, real blessing of God. And God, mightily, God is mightily using it. But for some weird reason, God seems to try to take it away from you. What did Job say? The Lord gives, and the Lord what? Taketh away. You might go, but God, this is my moment. This is the big blessing that I sacrificed and waited for all this time. And Lord, why are you taking it away? And God's like, because I want to give you a bigger one. I want to give you more of my power. It's good. That has given you power. I filled it. I used it. But I can do something more out of that. Give it to me. There are people who are willing to make sacrifices for the blessing of God but they can only go so far. Up to here, God, that's it. Yeah. My friend, John the Baptist is great, but Jesus is a lot better. Yeah. You know what God says about John the Baptist? Not a bad thing. It's real good, but it needs to be put into prison. It needs to be sacrificed. It needs to be killed. It needs to be given up. God has given you probably a blessing in this church or something to do in this church or something in your family or with your job, your current living situation, I don't know. But some of you know that God has been trying to take it away from you and you don't want to let it go. Because why? Why? Because this is what I sacrificed and did for you, Lord. And it's not a sin. It's, it's not Herod. It's John the Baptist. On, 
It's genuine. It's, he's filled with the Spirit. He's used by you, God. And God's like, don't you want Jesus? Don't you want my son? Don't you want his fullness? Give me John the Baptist. You need to put your John in prison. In prison. In prison. Something very precious in your life. It might even be a brother and sister in Christ or even in the home or even in this church. You know what God wants? Put it in prison. Give it up. Trust me with that. Let me give you Jesus. Why would God take away the blessings he's given to you? Because he wants to give you a bigger one. He wants to use you more. A really big blessing can only come if you would only sacrifice your smaller ones. My fifth point, the prime time of Christ. The prime time of Christ. Let's look at verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. I want you to look at my first sub-point here of my fifth point. In the prime time of Christ, we see my first sub-point, the point in time of Christ. The point in time of Christ. This is Christ's prime time moment. John the Baptist is out of the way, and Jesus says, now is my time to shine. This is my prime time now. And now he reached the point in time to show the results of the Holy Spirit. And that's what you always wanted. People always want the results from God, the accomplishments from God, and the blessings from God without, without the sacrifice, without the sacrificial filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can never give it to you unless you're filled with Him. Christ reached that point in time where he can now preach. He can display his power. He did his job. He accomplished his task. He went through the wilderness. Now he can let it shine and enjoy the moment. He's now reached that point in time. Bless God. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That such an hour as this, if you went through years of serving God, if you've been through the beginning from our church till now, bless God. You are now at a point in time when God has given its fruits, when we can have a blowout, when people have heard about this ministry, where hundreds have gotten saved, where people have gone right with God, where people get baptized. You're at the prime time. You're at a point in time to enjoy the shout, the fellowship, and everything. Yeah. Bless God. Enjoy every moment of it. When lunchtime comes, eat yourself, silly. We didn't have that for seven years, brother. We didn't. Bless God, I'm going to enjoy every food off of that plate. Bless God, I'm going to enjoy every moment. Coffee, food, fellowship. The people that it, I never got to fellowship, I got it now. The relationship, the family that I didn't have before, I got it now. The friends that I didn't have before, I got it now. The fruits and the results, and I'm talking about results, results, results given from God. I got it now that I didn't have before. Some of you got it now. Bless God, enjoy every moment of it. Jesus said, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Bless God, you got a lot of things at your hand. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy the thrill. Fellowship till late if you want to. Enjoy the souls. Win more souls if you have to. Use everything in this exposed, everything that's given to you. You got a church building. Enjoy every moment of it. The blessing God has provided in your family, your job, your money, and your future. Enjoy every ounce of it. Because you're now at a point in time that God has put you in. You might as well enjoy every moment. The problem with stubborn human nature is when God puts them in a point in time, 
of suffering, they don't take advantage of it. And when God puts them at a point in time to enjoy the blessing without suffering, people don't take advantage of it. We always live in a spoiled generation. No matter what point of time God puts you in, you always think about, it's better out there. Oh, it could be better. Oh, what about this? Oh, I find a problem with this. That's your problem. Then you'll never enjoy life. Now's your time to shine and revel the moment. Man, we got hymnals here that we didn't have before. We got songs here we didn't get before. We got singers here we didn't get before. We get music here we didn't get before. And we got preaching here we didn't get before. And more preachers here that we didn't get before. And guest speakers here that we didn't get before. Let's God revel the moment! Man, man, we, 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 we are such in a heyday right now. And let's just revel, enjoy the moment. We're at a point in time compared to many years before we didn't get. Where are you at? Let's, don't waste a single moment to enjoy because the devil wants to rob that out of you right with fighting, bickering, covetousness, and envy, and then depression. Yeah. He wants to rob it out of your life. My second sub-point is the powerful words of Christ. The powerful words of Christ. He says, the next part of verse 15, Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus finally got that big moment to preach to a huge audience. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Can you imagine Jesus? He's been waiting 30, 30 years for this day. 30 years to preach at that audience who was dying and going to hell who are lost in Judeo practices that were not even abiding by the law of Moses, under bondage and tyranny of Rome, and the Pharisees and Sadducees and those false prophets deceiving more, oh, Jesus kept it patient. He was a good boy for 30 years. And when he went out, he blew it all to pieces, ripped those Sadducees and Pharisees in half, and he said, I don't care, repent! But if he said that when he was in the will in the wilderness, it wouldn't have worked. If he preached those words by skipping the wilderness, those words probably would not work as much. God said, no, you need to go to the wilderness first at verse 13, then you preach verse 15. Why? The Spirit needs to fill you. That flesh needs to be truly emptied so that when those words come out when you preach, it really has power. Yes, sir. Preachers, listen up. When you get up on this pulpit, man, you guys preach excellent sermons. Yeah. But do they really have power? Yeah, that's it. That's good. Do they really have power? What's your wilderness? Have there been some wildernesses you bypassed? You try to run away? I've talked to some people who want to preach and they just want to preach and they just want to teach, take charge of a ministry. But when that wilderness, okay, here's the wilderness, they always run away. When the time comes for you to go to the wilderness, they run away. There's no such thing as shortcuts. There's no such thing as skipping the wilderness. You need to go through it. Otherwise, I don't care how great your outline is, empty words with no Holy Spirit. It's time for you to seriously check your heart and see which wilderness you have bypassed. You want, you want to do something big. You want a big blessing or a great thing in your life. How many of you have taken shortcuts to get some greatness in your life, some good things in your life? How many of you have done that and bypassed the wilderness? No, you need to go through. Otherwise, the riches that you have, the preaching that you're doing on this pulpit, the results you bring for the Lord are empty and has no power, no power from God. All the souls you led to Jesus Christ is empty without a wilderness. All those sermons that you brought, empty without a wilderness. The people you brought on the altar, empty without a wilderness. What are, which wilderness are you running away from? 
Which wilderness do you see I need to wander? Every head bow and every eye shut.